How's my levels? Uh, your levels are, uh, you know, piercing, but... Welcome to Thought Spiral. I'm Maddie Kidley, your host, and my co-host tonight is Josh Elvis Weinstein. How's it going, Josh? It's going swell, Eddie. Thanks 65 for asking. 65 degrees in Los Angeles. Wee, 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 wee. Is that as loud as you're going to get? I think I won't get louder than that. Okay, <laughs> That's just for me. That's not for levels. That's just for my own edification. Do you think that we should, like, here's what we should do. One week we meet, and we just record the opening. Yeah. Like 30 or 40 of them. Good evening. Sure. You're listening to Thought Spiral. Welcome. Just stuff like that. Welcome. Hey. Oh, or my fa- we are go- We are rolling now if we had to use this, right? If we had to use this. If we had to use this. <laughs> In a pinch. But, but uh, here, how about this? I love this on a TV. Oh, I didn't know you were here. What a surprise! Thanks for joining us. The turn to the camera, or was it? Just yeah, but in like this case, it's like a coffee. Well, in this case, it's like a uh, uh, an audio version of that. Right. Oh hi. Oh here. Oh, bo- Josh, oh, our guests have oh, arrived. Oh, put yourself together, Andy. You look very handsome tonight, and I only say that because I'm uh, rubbing your foot under the table. It's uh, and it's strangely comfortable. I make a nice live. I make a weird living. You do. Make no, that's a weird not the living. joke. <laughs> we all heard your living this past week. So people, la- seems to be the people are getting on the Andy Kindler, Josh, uh, on the sp- let's just call it the Thought Spiral bus. Sure. And they're loving it. You can call it the Andy Kindler bus when you're I not around like, me. If you, you know what, Josh? I'm so tired of this uh, egomaniac character. The, what, yours Yes, where I go, no, no, Josh, uh, you're also, it's this guy. You're also important. <laughs> you're as important. You're along the, for the ride. In many ways, <laughs> what you do is uh, almost as important as me. I understand. I like the backhanded compliments. So people are on board the Thought Spiral train is what you're saying i think the last show that we did i remember being very pumped up about it yeah and i think it was a good show it was before we went to montreal right well it's out there now so and what's your and what's your, uh, uh, we got a lot of mail this week thank you for that email not real mail yeah and here's the thing oh i wanted to ask you if i want to answer someone's email do i answer it to that i don't want people to have my just send, just send it to me and i'll put it in oh, okay thoughts but that's spiral. more work for you well you know okay because i can't is, have people Andy. it all is Nobody can know where we I'm live. I'm answering the emails already myself. So. I know. it's um, With your own email or the thought no, at I'm spiral at spiral? spiral? Yeah. yeah you know, because want... God forbid someone crack the code that is my oh, email yeah. address. If anybody finds out I'm Andy Ba 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 Kindler at AOL. They always get the wrong number of Ba's. So. No, I'm actually funny, funny, funny dude at AOL. That's the same as your license plate then. Oh, yeah. I thought it would be good because it would get, get my name out there. That's right. Brand identification. Who needs humor at AOL.com? Two, two, two. <laughs> right. down. So, no, I know. Two, two, two got me. You, can't, you, can't, you got me right at the end there. With two, 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 two. Yeah. Um, you know, the last time I heard, and if I've done this joke, please allow me to do it again. Sure. The last time I heard someone use the word establishment, uh-huh. like Bernie Sanders does, it was uh, Mr. Dixon on Room 222. Wow, that is... Now, that's not a bad joke, though. You know, I can't even... I can only just acknowledge that it's a reference. Why? Because I never watched that show. Are you kidding? And you claim to be a a student of history? (laughs) I do, but I have some gaps. So, uh... So what was I saying? I can't do this. I promised myself my yeah. life coach. I met with my life coach today. <laughs> right. um, oh, I'm sorry, my podcasting life coach. Right. You do remember, you have one too? You remember the appointment, which is a good start. <laughs> <laughs> do you? Do, uh, uh, when you said to me, "Can we push it back?" My heart soared like an eagle. Really? And it only made me four minutes late. It was good. It was nice. Were you surprised? Did you think it was going to be my usual? Um, you know, at a certain point, I don't notice. And do you judge me? I st- not on that. Really? Yeah. No, I judge you, but not on that. Okay, but other things that are more important and oh, horrible. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I don't, I don't judge till like tw- it's L.A. So I don't judge until at least fifteen minutes. Really, fifteen minutes is unforgivable. But what also is unforgivable? See, this is what I have in my head. Thank you, Dad. When I went to a uh, uh, a kid's uh, bar mitzvah and they had a party and I wasn't out there at the appointed time, my dad was like, "Where were you?" and all that kind of stuff. Look, I'm not saying I don't blame him for everything. Yeah, but. I the thing I don't want to do is look at my own behavior and uh, and adjust accordingly. <laughs> right, yeah. right. It's a little late in the game, honestly. It is at this point. Uh, you know, my wife hates when I say this, and for good reason. But we watch those horrible uh, housewife shows. We can't stop it. Right. And Bethany, who might be the worst person on TV, she's just. I mean, I'm sure she's not as bad in real life. Bethany, you know Bethany. 
No, but you know, skinny girls. You're gonna have to hook me into the story pretty soon. We're not gonna. You, that's all you need to know. <laughs> she has gotten it into her craw or whatever. She's like, get off my jock. She says to that, other women. That's her new thing. Yeah. Hey, she says, you know what? Get off my jock. She huh. doesn't wear a. What's the point of that? I don't know, Andy. Yeah, you don't if know. You're start unraveling at the unraveling the what's the point of it thread while watching Housewives. I can't help. You. I'm just telling you that some of the situations look contrived. <laughs> Sometimes I think that these things are have been have been uh, uh, they've been urged on by the producers. No, that's, I feel that's, like that's crazy talk. They couldn't call it a reality show, if that right? Because that's yeah. true. Now I did see a story or the thing or whatever I saw that the uh, maybe it was one of the CNN. Have you seen the sh- the show CNN Ruins the Twentieth Century? Uh, yes, I've seen every decade. 40s, so 50s, far. 60s, yes. 70s. Hey, did you like the 80s? Not anymore. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> we've replaced your memories. So now what? The, now look. I'm going to a doctor. I don't know what I, I don't know what I was was going to say. I forgot it. I don't know what it was, but it had something to do with with CNN and going to the old days. <laughs> Have you been watching the CNN? Right, but the, has that helped me with the thing I forgot to say? I don't know. How we, does it help any of us? We, well, we were talking about what. You, see, the thing is, I was hoping for two things. Okay, you'd be the answer man, right? Oh, Josh, who was what? Now, what kind of suits did Edgar Buchanan wear? Edgar Buchanan, well, he wore Botany 500. Why did, what is suffrage? Where did that come from initially? Uh, originally, it was from the old English uh, suffrage. Right. Why is there air, Josh? This is what I thought. You'd be it's the actually, answer, man. There isn't anymore. <laughs> You've just used the rest of it. No, but if I told you to explain to me the elements of air, yeah. would you be able to? Uh, I'd be able to name the top three or four. O. There's two O's. There's O. There's some H. There's yeah. some N. But you, there's more N than you'd think. Actually. But why doesn't it all collapse on a daily basis? Do uh, I have to ask Penn Jillette or another libertarian? I think so. And then the other thing is, I thought you have a oh, you would have a wheelhouse. Like yeah, this you know is what? your wheelhouse. Yeah, I know. Like I sports, don't. I don't. No, you do. You have some. What is a field that you know about that nobody cares about, but you know a lot about? Butterfly collecting? Andy Kindler's career. <laughs> oh, that's true. You do know too much about my. You do know too much about my career. I know a lot. And now, now we haven't seen each other for a while. And it's I'm, been two weeks since we've seen each other, which in this modern podcast era seems like a lot. It's over. In fact, they go. It used to be like we used to be like twice a year friends, close friends, but twice a we year. Were, right. <laughs> But and it was and but now we've opened up our relationship and the thing that I like is the last couple of times I do feel more comfortable doing it naked and you do too. Well, you know, I think it's the only way we're going to get to the truth, Andy. Are people going to judge us because we hug during the podcast? I don't know. I think people need more cuddling in the world. Why can't I stop making gay references? I don't know. It's not, I don't know why I keep yes ending them because either, men love it's just it. like it's either that or go yuck. Oh, why? Right. You know, that's what so, two men have to do. So, Joke about I'm sleeping. Just Yes, and you're all of your gay jokes. But you never make jokes about sleeping with me. Is it because you don't find me attractive? It's especially because I don't find you attractive. What, you want to know what happened on the way over here with the house that I normally go by? Is that what you asked me? Nope. They weren't, okay. they weren't in the window. I'm they guessing. were not in the window. They, were, they yeah. were all shut down. Right. And I think I noticed blood. Really? <laughs> streaking down the <laughs> Inside window. or outside? I don't know. But those people, they, they, uh, w- w- boy, if those walls could talk. They would, they would be more interesting than paint drying. You'd think they'd be going, Jew alert, by now, at this you, time of night. Do you think people can see my Judaism coming or see I it going? I think so. I think you... Uh, Why? I think you are like... You're Jewish, too. I think you're just as Jewish as me. I don't know. Let's ask a Nazi. <laughs> that would be a perfect uh, way. People say, when are you going to have guests? Right. When we have just Nazis. Right. When we, and we phone them in. Phone-ins are the way to no, go. I don't want Nazis. them here. <laughs> yeah. But I was also hoping you'd be you would be this guy. So we oh, in fact, online, you know who likes identifying Jews, by the way, is is uh, Israelis. How do you mean? I mean, every time I meet an Israeli and they hear Weinstein, they go, "Oh, shalom." Yeah. I just I just had yeah, I had uh, I ordered some frozen uh, ribs from a uh, from a you know a specialty purveyor, and right? I, and I had them delivered, and it was this Israeli guy. Uh, who was like, oh, Weinstein, hey, shalom. And I'm like, you know, you're saying shalom as you're handing me a bag of pork. <laughs> so, did you say that to him? I did, yes. And did he laugh like a he maniac? Laughed, no, he laughed like... Not too much. Not too much, but he laughed enough. But I was hoping you'd the guy, be the guy who go, oh, in fact, we have a Nazi online too. Uh, uh, Adolf, are you there? Yeah, that would be a producer, and our producer lives in... Uh, no, you're, you're signaling me like I'm supposed to be Adolf? 
<laughs> Hello, am I on the air? Yes, Adolf. Now, why are you not? This is if we were Nichols and May. Yes. Right? Uh-huh. Yes, I Now, why, are you, why did you decide to become a Nazi? <laughs> well, it's, it really comes down to what your parents teach you. <laughs> See, this is hysterical. I want you by next Friday, and listeners, please, e- please email <laughs> eight wacky characters that Josh could call in as. The neighbor next door who's, who's uh, uh, moving. Uh-huh, which is actually the happening. I'll do that guy. You say I'm uh, on the line. Uh, hello, you're on the air. Hi, uh, Josh. I'm your neighbor from next door. Oh, that's fantastic. I wish, you know we, I wish we could have met. You know I'm moving, right? No. I, uh, I thought you said you did not know. Oh, I, damn. Well, use your real life with this. Okay. okay. I thought I was a radio host. Uh, uh, what's his name or a fake name? Uh, his fake name is Adolf, okay. oddly enough. <laughs> is it really? <laughs> yes. Okay. Hi, hi, Josh. It's Adolf from next door. Dolph, how are you? I'm thinking of moving. I mean, I guess I am moving. Well, that's that's. Uh, we'll, we'll miss you. Well, I wanted to get my lawnmower back from you before I left. Oh well, that no, I, no, that's uh, I'm going to need it to mow my lawn. Yes, and I also would like the firecrackers that you you kept from me over. Th- okay, look, I hate bits. <laughs> I hate improv. I hate sketches. I hate scenarios. Yeah, that's what I hate more than anything that, else. Well, scenarios are really the worst. Yeah, because once you have a scenario, then there's nowhere to go but in it. Someone give us a suggestion. Something you've prepared. And uh, a, 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 now a situation. Doing a podcast. Now an activity. Something that would be entertaining to other people that you don't need the crowd to suggest. There you go. You've just shit on improv. That's right. And I don't care. What's, like, they really would bother me. Yeah, I know. What are they going to do? Come over to my house and yes, end me to death? <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh. Huh? Oh, interesting. We have a baby on line four. No, no we, <laughs> we don't. don't. Boy, did you get sunken down low from that. Oh, you know, it's, it's the, the performance. <laughs> <laughs> it's pure gold. I got, and, actually, I heard, I heard from my brother the, uh, uh, the other day, and he, he somehow implied that perhaps the Foster Brooks impression is getting old. <laughs> No, my own no brr, way. My own brr, my own brr, uh, my older sibling says. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. Andy Levy loves it. Yeah. Andy right. Levy loves Andy it. Levy, Andy Levy loves it. And Andy Levy loves it. Two hundred dollars from Andy Levy. Kaching. Kaching. Wouldn't it so, be great okay, let's if people down. really would? <laughs> oh, buckle down. Let's buckle down. Okay. Because I, I want to hear about Montreal. Okay. We well, let's talk. We've been not talking about it on purpose, so we could talk about it. All right. Later. This is unbelievable. The whole express. Well, I sound like Trump now. Unbelievable. It's never been done. Can't be believing. <laughs> it's the best state of the industry speech that's ever been given. I I'll, heard from the Boy Scouts. I'll tell you that. He always says that. I'll tell you that. That much. Okay. Well, this uh, last year, I say everything we do uh, pre OCD treatment. Post OCD treatment. Okay. So last year I was in the throes of not knowing that I had OCD, not realizing I was obsessing more and more and more and more and more, and I did not like the way the speech went. I couldn't even. Rem- I mean, I don't even remember. The whole experience was weird. Yeah. So now this year, this year I made a mistake, and the mistake was saying to myself, "Oh, you're cured now. This is, uh, <laughs> boy, aren't you going to love your new speech?" Having cured all your problems, right? Turns out that didn't happen. No. And now here's the thing: you and I are very uh, close uh, spiritually, and I also think we were meant to be placed on this earth to work out stuff. I don't really believe this, so don't write anything about it. But <laughs> you wrote. You like to write. You love to uh, write like ta- like jokes. Yeah, I like you know, it. yeah. When, when you're in the mood, and it seems like you're in the mood more than I am. <laughs> they had twelve. Best jokes, Burns, from the thing, seven of them were yours. Seven of them were yours. In that article? In that article from, uh, maybe it was the, the comics comic, maybe? I don't know. Yeah. So, so you had said to me, Andy. So seven out of 12. Seven out of 12 of, of this one. I just said seven out of 12. What I are you know, trying no, to do? I'm just trying to let it just like, you I'm, just trying to, I'm trying to bathe in it a little bit. <laughs> you had said to me beforehand, <laughs> if you want to. Whatever you want help with, I mean, first you tried to say ten bucks an hour, but then I, <laughs> uh, uh, no, you said I'd like to, you know, if you need any help, I, I would go over stuff with you, and you said like send stuff over, so that immediately got me. That flummoxed you, yeah, because then me. suddenly it was an assignment in yes. your head, yes, as opposed to an offer, right? And so I would try to all day long as I was working on stuff, I'd be saying I have to get it ship shape enough tonight. 
to send it over to Josh. All right. So I wasted hours doing that. And, of course, I, I built you up as an ogre, in a way. Right. Not an ogre, but a taskmaster. An task ogre master. who was giving you baskets of free jokes, that kind of ogre? Yeah, I know, but it was like, uh, I, oh, I, this, if, this, if the price is me having to do something, that's a little high. All right. This is the first year I ever had anybody. So I'm trying to get the message here. So was it bad that I helped? Absolutely not. Okay. It was bad for me emotionally when, it first, when we first went into it. Right. Uh, and then I got to the other side of it. Because my thing is, I've never had anybody work on this. Do, do I mean people have you, you've you've pitched things in other years and stuff like that. You've had jokes, and I pitch them. So stop saying pitch them. <laughs> we, we don't get together in a gym right. and raise our hands. I've had people over the years listen back to my sets right. and try to extract the information from there. But I've never had anybody that I was showing the speech to before I did it. So when we met at. How do we name the place that we met? We don't want to tell. Do you, how much? Our you, local diner. Yeah, but how close do you want people to know about where we live? I think we've we've already set the. We're in the valley. The flagpole. At, yes. at Jimmy O's five eight and under men store. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> they know that already. Yeah, okay, right. so that they can easily locate. Right. Well, very near there is a popular diner <laughs> that is, I guess, from the fifties. Huh. <laughs> And I guess the people, what's the gimmick there? They're from the 50s? Uh, the gimmick is, uh, yeah, no. Okay. The only thing 50s really is little mini jukeboxes. Okay, I'm going to tell, tell her from my point of view, and then you feel free to interject. And I would love to find out what you were thinking of all this while I was thinking it. Right. So we get down there. We start eating. Uh-huh. We order a meal. And, and did I pick up the, che- the check? Uh, yeah, I'm Thank sure. You. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I started small talk. And then at one point, I remember you... Did I actually yes, point you went, to my Okay, thing? let's do this now. Let's do this now. Okay. And then my heart, I started to get scared. Yeah, you froze up. Uh, you locked up. I locked up, and then I could not remember. No, what I should have done was I should have had some notes and things and topics at that meeting. Right. I didn't. I didn't. I had something. Oh, I, I thought I had things, but I didn't. And then I get into this thing where I lock up. I can't remember. Who am I going to make fun of? Was, I guess it's Jay Leno again. Right. <laughs> And then when we were trying to work on things, I felt pressure to come up with something funny in front of you, which I'm not good at, only because I make myself not good at it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think you're funny, or this whole thing would never have happened. <laughs> right, but I don't believe... See, all of, I'm not trying to make this... I did get an email today about someone who has... I mean, a direct message from someone whose wife has OCD yeah. and, thanked, and thanked me for talking about it. And that does... I mean, it really does make me feel good if anything that we talk about help somebody else but mostly i'd like to hurt people with this podcast <laughs> yeah, if only we can really cause more pain in the world then you know right <laughs> why quit ever so you told me okay so i here's how i saw it okay i had nothing and when i told started to tell you a couple of things what I, my ideas were i think because they came out so poorly you kind of said well those aren't even really jokes really it was like uh one of them was about george lopez maybe or well i don't remember i, I want to do a whole thing about people can't have too many shows yeah but i was just kind of explaining it and it didn't sound funny right. but then it made me feel like well, i've got nothing what were you thinking during that um i was thinking wow andy is not used to this kind of joke writing so i'll just you know i'll just <laughs> I'll, I'll eat my eggs and We'll you know we'll throw out stuff and we did we got a, we got a few things out. Now let me ask at you that, this: at that lunch we actually got and then we came back here to the house and we got more stuff written. Right, but let me ask you a question on an emotional level because this is what and if you feel these things, you can tell me because I have to take this from people. Yeah. Did that make you angry? Did you think less of me a little bit because of it? Or did you feel used a little bit? No, because it was all I volunteered for this. This wasn't like you came to me begging. For my help, I just kind of offered it, you know, and then I could tell, like when I said, hey, yeah, send me over topics, I'll write some jokes for you, I could tell that that was like freezing you up. I could tell that, you know, you're just, you know, that the obligation of it froze you up. So, and the, so I was like, okay, let's get together. And then, you don't, then you don't have to send me anything. So the lesson for this is the lesson I'm learning. I don't want to be obnoxious about it, like one of those people who's always in therapy, but I hate, on some level, I hate myself. And on some level, I believe I'm a fuck up. I absolutely, I don't hate myself intensely. It's right. less now. Sure. But 
I said to myself, you, you, there's no excuse for you not having come to this meeting prepared. He's offering you help. And what I normally would do in life before right. I got help was I would somehow project that on the other person somehow. Like not want to hear that from the other person right. and then withdraw as a human being in general. Now I'm saying this came up with me with Josh. I don't know what he was thinking, but I know what it touched off in me. And it's so it's good for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, in this case, I, I know you pretty damn well. So, you know, so I was, you know, I was figuring things out you right. know, as a friend, like, oh, I can see what's happening here, you know, and I approach joke writing different than you, you know. Yes. It was my, you know, I, I haven't just been writing for myself all these years. I've written for a lot of people, you know, and so it's a muscle that's worked, you know, so it's not, it isn't an emotional thing to sit down and write jokes for me. I could tell in this case, because this is like Andy Kindler Black Sunday, this speech, or right. Black, Black Friday, right? <laughs> you know, that, you know, it, there's a whole bunch of shit on top of it. So I literally, I was j honest to God, just trying to be supportive in any way I could, but I wasn't, but I knew that. You know, it wasn't going to be a simple process. Right. Because I know that there's some, you know, I saw you last year when you were a month out from the speech, yeah. you know, and I know that it's, you know, it's a tough month for you. And you actually did way fucking better this year. Oh. Uh, in terms of your, like, freaking out and in terms of, like, But not you know, that you saw. Well, well, I will I tell mean, you about the day of. Well, day of. Not yet. That's, yeah. But we'll I will tell you, there, because but. the day of was an epic freak out. Yeah. Where my wife was actually... Didn't say she was worried about me, right, but she, but she, she was got, worried. Got, got about all nice to you, did she? <laughs> it was terrible. But I'll let's I'll, I'll hold that off. Now here's the thing. All right, so so yeah. we get through that lunch. Did you did you get something out of that day? It seemed like you got something. Okay, now out here's of that the thing. Day. I also think people, if you're a writer or want to be a writer, this is a good thing that you taught me from that day that I did not think about before. You said, although I was ultimately failed at this. You said, write it like a speech. like, And I have done that over the years, like right. going on a little bit. But then I go off onto these things where then you read it later and it sounds like you're at Toastmasters General or something. Yeah. So you said, write it like a speech. Now, I was... That I just said, write the first five minutes. Just so, you'll, just so you'll have that, knowing that you have that solid coming out of the gate as a base. That was my suggestion. And it was an excellent suggestion, although I had trouble doing it. Right. But I, okay. Then the other suggestion that you had, which... I said, what I normally do is I listen back to all these sets um, and to see what's on them. And you said, that's not a good use of my time. And you were right about that. Good. I did listen to a couple of targeted things because I wanted to find out some wording on things. Right. But in general, and I, and I should, I don't think it would hurt me to listen to my sets more during the year because I think <laughs> right. it would be good. But to try to cram them at the end. Yeah. No, that's just a wormhole you can go down. Yeah. And so uh, I took it – the negative things I took from it also was because it was getting near the speech. And I actually thought maybe Josh no longer thinks I – mean, I'm telling you, I have these thoughts. Wow. Maybe he doesn't think I'm that funny because uh, like, like it's all attitude with me. I don't have any – and I started to buy my own negative press. <laughs> <laughs> so those things – but I would not that they stayed with me. Not that they stayed with me. That's why I think I'm getting better. They didn't stay with me. But right. I thought about that. You know, like uh, like you like you were. I thought you must be judging that I don't write a lot of jokes. <laughs> I mean, no, I wasn't judging. I knew the. I knew who I was working with. Right. Going in. Right. So no, you're not funny. <laughs> But no one makes me laugh more, so it's a weird dichotomy. That's the thing. Nobody make we make each other uh, howl, which I think is a very spiritual, also a spiritual thing. And 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 I love to be able to get to that point where I'm not self conscious and I'm just jamming. I just think it, it takes experience doing that, working with someone else. It totally does, especially when it's your act. I, you know, the one person I can't write for me. Oh, okay. You know, that, yeah. I, I, you know, for something to be worthwhile for me talking about in my own act, for it's a it's it's some fucking code. I can't. You know, in other that, words, so like you you actually it, it becomes a thing. Like I would it'd be not an OCD thing, but it becomes a, a like you don't want to do it. Yeah, it just doesn't seem. It doesn't feel. You're emotionally invested in yourself. Pretty Maybe. yeah. It's just I mean that's mm -hmm. that's the thing. I can write jokes for I can write them in your voice. I can write them in anyone else's voice. When it comes to my own voice, it's like it's a much. It's for some reason there's way more filters happening. It's not. It's not that I can't write for myself. It's just that choosing things to talk about 
right is is hard it's interesting though because you come up with a joke uh it, it's like you came up with jokes that were like i wish i could come up with <laughs> jokes like that they were hilarious jokes seven out of 12 baby <laughs> uh uh did i do the thing about my i hope my rage is more is less random this year i think you did it was a little yeah. a little scattered at the top <laughs> yeah but now, do you are you do you like it when other people give you suggestions for your bits, or they don't tend to give you people suggestions? People tend to not. Why is that? Well, partially because I don't do you know because mm. no one sees my acts. Right, you're not. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, you know. I think things have changed, and I'm trying to change them by trying to do more stand up. So if anyone's listening and has a set open, give me right. a call. Um, but you know, yes, I, th- I people... think if, if I was doing sets every week, you know, and I. You know, and that's why I'm coming to Minneapolis, so I can do several sets in a row and just work on new stuff. At the end of this month, I will be appearing at the Acme Comedy Club with Josh. I think I forget the dates, the 22nd You'll or something? You'll be there the 22nd through the 25th, which yes. is Tuesday through Saturday. All the first three nights, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'll be doing guest sets. And on Thursday, we'll, we're doing we'll remind lo- you at the end of the podcast, yes. but we're doing a live podcast at Acme Comedy Club, Thursday the 24th Can you of believe August. It? At 5.30 p.m., the this prime so live podcast time. But we could be, this could be, we could make a fortune on this, right? None of this. No, it's $7. <laughs> but isn't that like a $7 times 500 people? Right. But yeah, they don't have 500 still not people a fortune, there, right? But even, no. <laughs> I want one Louis C.K. or Emo Phillips payoff. Oh, this will, you know, this is the entry level. This is okay. A, this, yeah. I, figured, I figured since we're just kind of doing it, mm-hmm. $7, no one expects anything for $7. <laughs> so we're good. <laughs> This is the kind it's of thing. It's your paywall, Andy. What I finally you... put up your paywall. Okay. Okay, so I get back to my house. And... This, is after, this is after you were here? Right. Okay. Then I go up to Montreal on the Monday. Now, the other thing that was tremendously helpful that I don't know if you remember saying it was tremendously helpful was that you said, and have you said this on the podcast, that all writers, most writers do wait to the last minute. They're not like Johnny on the spot with their stuff. Yeah. It's not worth thinking. You're a terrible person because you're waiting for the last and so, minute. It's and it's not, so terrible. It's not time well spent. And the thing about it is, it's like, I wish I could explain to you how pervasive this voice is inside me. Forget about even the topic. It's like this Christian work ethic guy or a guy who's like, even this is the guy saying this to me in my head. Yeah. Even if you started today trying to write a book or something, you're, it's already too late. <laughs> right. So when you said that to me, that comforted me because for some reason I had actually believed this thing of I should be, you know, writing it for months. Right. And so I, I let that go. The only thing that saved me from spinning out of control even more was just saying, I mean, it sounds silly, but just saying you're not a bad person. You're not a bad person. <laughs> you're not a terrible person. You're not a terrible person. And because all- fake it till you make it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> But no, but you know why? Because because it was like, I would just get on Twitter, right? I would do all the horrible things I do, <laughs> and I was I was kind of you saw it right? I was, yeah, I was watching from afar, going, "Wow, he really doesn't want to write. <laughs> he really doesn't want to write." <laughs> I went through such a psychic terror about. So anyway, so normally I would always tell myself that I would write it. Before I got write a draft before I got to Montreal, right? And many times in the years before, I would have some kind. Of draft. That doesn't mean it was any better. Right, sure. <laughs> so this way, I got up there with all kinds of different topics and things, but nothing in speech form. Right. And I started working on it, and then I sent you a whole. I said, "Look, Josh, I keep wanting. I spent hours trying to prepare to send you things. Right. And then I just said, "I'm going to send Josh." I said, "I know this is confusing." Uh, and I just sent you a bunch of gobbledygook. And, right. what, and what did you say? I said, this is too much of a challenge for my ADD. <laughs> and just send me requests. Like, right. you want to to- send me a topic, I'll send you back a joke. <laughs> and I did, right? Yes. <laughs> and of course, the thing is, I have this fear. It's, it's all silly. But I have this fear that something is going to be the last straw with every relationship I have. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you're going to say, Andy, all you said to me was, that was good. I received that information. Good. I did start to spin out on it a little bit, but then I could keep myself <laughs> relatively. So I kept trying. I, I worked, did work every night, but I would also spin off, uh, go on uh, tw- Twitter things. And so the night before the speech, 
it was about 12, 14 hours before the speech. I basically, not a nervous breakdown, but I did panic. Yeah. And I, had, I, 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 I can't do it. I couldn't make it take all these different documents into one document. Right. So what I did was very smart. I tweeted that I'm going after Ricky Gervais <laughs> in 12 hours. Uh-huh. That was a very good thing to do because then people started attacking me sure. from overseas. Right. And then I started to say to myself, hey, idiot, moron. That's how I talk to myself. In this case, it was right. right. Why are you doing this? Why are you stirring it up before the goddamn speech? You, don't you know it's going to take you out of the mode? And then I would yell at myself more, yell at myself more. And I thought my career, not my career was over, but it's like, I have fears like the police are going to get me. <laughs> right. Like uh, like with the Ricky Gervais stuff, there's this troll guy who writes articles about me and he <laughs> accuses me of slander. <laughs> you know, I don't slander. But if I say Derek sucks, that's not slander, Josh. No. Unless no, you think not. it is. No. <laughs> so then I was like, oh my God, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. When Susan got up in the morning, it was like, it was like this. I, uh, <laughs> This time I'm serious. <laughs> I really, I don't know what. I, yeah, I, uh, you, do you have any jokes? I have a couple, but yeah, <laughs> I have a So, <laughs> I was able. That's the most acting you've ever done. Okay. <laughs> They're going to kill me. Who? Why are you doing? Why did I agree to do this speech? Twenty-two years later, why would I agree to do this? Ricky Gervais's followers are horrible. First of all, they use words like bloke and chap, so which makes me so mad. I just can't stand them. But anyway, then I just made one big document. Okay, good. I started to feel calm around ten or eleven or twelve. I made one big document, printed it out a half hour before the speech, and the other award show was running late, and. But the things you can't believe the last minute things I, I, I have to do. Yeah. The jokes you gave me were in an email. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to print them out somehow. I had to print them out. And did you see me rustling? I rustled for about 10 minutes. I'm looking for three jokes from you. <laughs> right. Do you know what they were? Uh, no. Which ones? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was the ones with uh, something about the CNN. Maybe it was a CNN joke or something. But well, I did those jokes about. You did uh, some of, yeah, I you, did those jokes. So I don't know, but it was like, I, the fact that the speech before me was going long right. gave me a little extra time to get stuff together more right. and to find those jokes of yours. So it's like my life. I don't know if it's ever going to change from this horrible roller coaster, but it, it was definitely. I felt after the speech that I had completed something really good. One whole year, the year being broken up by. Big you know, problems, getting help for my problems, which I assume would cure them by now. Yeah. And then just getting the speech under my belt this year. And then it went well. And I was just, I was just thrilled. I was so relieved. And you felt good about it? Yeah, because here's the difficulty uh, with the speech. And because we had talks about this, uh, you can guess what are they, they going to, you know, are they going to laugh at this or are they going to laugh at that? Right. Whatever the thing is. Like, uh, uh, I was talking about giving people less shows or whatever the thing is. I never, they're never going to laugh like when I first started the speech because they're all plugged into every show that's coming out and there's basically three networks and there's all the big wigs are there. Right. It's never going to be that way again because sometimes I look in the eyes, I don't know why they came to the speech. <laughs> right. You know? And, and so, Montreal muscle memory at this point. Right. And so it's like some, t- some things I thought were going to kill. I, 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 people know who they are because I mentioned that afterwards that they didn't kill. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's I, usually pretty. Dave apparent. Becky, Dave Becky. Yes, I can't forget to do Dave Becky. Right. I thought that would kill. That would have. It did okay, but it would have killed in the old Montreal days. Right. Because it kind of got a strong laugh, yeah. but you went back. First of all, you kind of you switched from Dave Becky to Dave Rath, is what it seemed like in the, at one point. Well, I say hey, I say hi, Dave Rath. How are you? I'm okay. <laughs> this is a guy who's normally would be standing on his head doing bits for me. <laughs> it's year 22 that's the problem it's year 22 and the other thing I will say that I know is true about me because I've seen it with other comics is that I am always over exaggerating how poorly I'm doing right there's well, nothing that people could do that would be enough of a response <laughs> right so but the bottom line is and guy, I thought Guy was great Guy Branham brought me up I love him it was great yeah and so I'm very happy everything went I really thought you well. did great I mean I thought you know I think you know I laughed 
throughout. <laughs> so, right. You know. I'm very happy with everything. And then, uh, then oh, the, then yesterday that guy wrote that article. Another this guy who's just uh, somebody I blocked is just writing these articles about me. But you, it's unbelievable. Online, people say, "Yeah, I read that about Andy," and uh, they assume it's true. Well, but you retweeted it like three times too. That's that's a different <laughs> issue. <laughs> If you don't want people to read it, probably not retweeting it is the way it no, I think, is a good start. Right. <laughs> but I think you I think you, you know, I think there's two things. One thing is I know I have problems, but then there's something like I have to say this thing and then I did get it out of my system and the th- basically I just wanted to say I know I have issues, but mocking other comedians is not trolling. That's not trolling. That's just mocking other comedians. I don't know. I mean, I think I think in the case of Ricky Gervais, you straddled the line. Why? Because you were relentless in your. Uh, it it wasn't like it was a playful exchange. Well, I don't like him. Right, but then. Well, how's that trolling? Why isn't that just? Why doesn't he block me if he doesn't like it? I don't know. I thought it was a genius stroke that you blocked him, and then you kept going. Well, but no, but had now. you had you actually blocked him and just walked now. away and pretended like it never happened, it would have been Andy Kaufman esque. See, I don't understand. See, here's the thing: I understand that on Twitter that your problems are out there for people to see, and it's annoying to them. Right. Oh, but the other part of it is, what is it anybody's business? Just block me, scroll past me. It's not true that I was obsessed with Ricky with Ricky Gervais. If you look back over the whole year. I'm, uh, I wrote about Jimmy Fallon, Ricky Gervais. It's just not true. It's true that people start accusing me of being obsessed. Well, which but gets I'll me tell upset. you from from one one level away, people ask people ask me more uh, fairly often, "What's Andy's deal with Ricky Gervais?" Because well, it's like you know you've done it enough so that it's <laughs> it's a trademark almost. Well, I don't. What I got very angry at was when he started talking about my just bringing my wife into it, my poor wife. Yeah. And then I just realized the guy is a sadistic bully. Well, you know? I mean, it it almost has nothing to do with him. I mean, this was all like you said the night before the thing. Your whole point is to just wake no, up no, this hornet's nest of, of sycophants ta- who are trying to impress him with their response. Forget about to you. that. That's my self sabotage. I'm talking about the whole year leading up to that. The whole year leading up to that, I reject the notion that somehow I'm doing it too much with him. It's hilarious for me to see some of his stupid promotions <laughs> with his mouth open to gape. Uh, to me, it's hilarious. That's what Twitter is well, for, to well, mock that. Uh, okay. How's that? But how's that stalk? He calls me a stalker. How's that stalking him? Uh, he's saying it to get under your skin. I know. Hmm. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> It's that simple. Yeah. You know, you've proven yourself to be easily provoked and therefore fun. Right. You know? That's so, true. You know, we've, we've, we've talked about this a lot. You know, I don't, I have, you know, you can do whatever the fuck you want on Twitter. It's not the most entertaining thing you do as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Would you, you think the whole thing isn't? No, I think the, if the occasional really funny um, mockery is cool. Making it seem like it's your mission in life seems like a beneath no, no, you. I reject that. <laughs> okay. I reject that, that, that characterization. I know you do, but I'm because talk- I'll show you 24-hour period and there's what there could be one Ricky Gervais thing or there may be no Ricky Gervais things. Why do you yeah. say that that's omnipresent? Uh, because it, I, as someone who's who follows you <laughs> over the last several years, it's there. It's 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 a it's a big part of your Twitter, and maybe it's because you always retweet people's responses to you, and your response to I them. I don't always retweet. You people's frequently. Responses. I'm going to stop using always, and I'm going to start what using do I frequently. You mean like trolls? Like when, yeah, when someone says something nasty to you, you'll you'll tweet your joke back at them to the world. Well, so therefore, it seems. So therefore, we're seeing much of your interchange. We're seeing not just your Ricky Gervais joke, but we're seeing nine responses to people who are pissed off about your Ricky Gervais joke and trying to get under your skin. I'm not, well, I wouldn't think, I don't, def- when I go off on people and I feel terrible, I don't like any of that stuff. It yeah. starts to get bad. But I still reject the idea that that's what all I do on Twitter. It's, it's not, not all you do on Twitter. Don't, no, you don't said the occasional <laughs> funny thing, but you're implying that mostly I'm arguing with people. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't think that's true. I think th- I think you put you put plenty of funny jokes on Twitter too, but I think the thing the 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 you know the vibe you get is a lot of conflict. Okay. 
We'll have to. I'll, I'll, I'll take that as an advisement. I'm not convinced of that. Okay. Because <laughs> here's the thing. Again, Twitter's become the symbol of what's wrong with my life in terms of my battle, because I'm total. That's where my obsessions go. Right. So I know it's an obsession, but it does not help me. It doesn't help me that you don't like it, or other, it doesn't a certain way. I want my friends. All my friends have warned me about Twitter. I'm thankful for that. Yeah. But that's not going to help. That's not going to change anything. I'm not so trying not gonna... to change. You asked me what I thought, and I'm telling you how I perceive it. I but can't, you, but, but I don't. I, you know, I know. Do but, it. Do, you, you're going to do what you do, but and, you, the, and you, I'm still going to love you. <laughs> right. I understand that, but you see, I guess I'm saying it's like I don't have a philosophy of how I'm doing Twitter. To me, Twitter's like Twitter is the thing that's supposed to be. Whatever you want to say. So I don't say, oh, I'm going to get my jokes going or, oh, I'm going to get. But, you know, if I go uh, uh, talk about Trump, people, well, you're talking about Trump all the time. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're on Twitter. People give you shit on Twitter. That's what Twitter is. Yeah. People will give you shit. If you're looking for a fight, you will find it. You will find it immediately and frequently if you're looking for it. Well, there's another part of that, too. The other part of that is that, and people have said this to me. Uh, which I think I w- was thinking about. Like, and they said, look, if you want to argue about uh, how much I hate new atheism and how much I hate p- people who hate, who are mean to Muslims, I could write a blog or something like that. Right. I don't think I'm going to do that. But I have been able to uh, refine what it is that I, that I believe. Yeah. And I've been able to say, say it more succinctly. And I think previously to this, I'm not saying I should get into arguments, but I'm also finding a lot of people who are starting to get upset at Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins. And the other part of it is I think people could be rounded up and uh, and genocide could happen in this country. So I'm upset about it for that reason. Now, now you, the naysayers, (laughs) you may say you're not helping by getting angry about it. I don't know. I really don't know. I'm not I don't have a plan. And obviously, I get in trouble a lot. So I don't know what the solution is. The, the best solution is I try not to pick up the, the, the device. Yeah. Probably that's the best solution, you know, just because I don't, you know, I use it to, to vent my spleen on, you know, online too. But I hate fucking bickering. I hate it. No, no, you, yeah. You I know, hate, so I don't. Why do you hate bickering? I fucking hate it. I don't know. I don't know. think you do. It, it gets, you don't hate bickering. <laughs> yes, I do. Now, yes, I do. From? I'm not going to bicker with you. I will not bicker is with you. Is that Firestein Theater or is it Monty Python? Uh, well, this, the, the, argument. the argument sketch is Monty Python, okay. <laughs> which my wife uses in her uh, English class when she's... It's the greatest one ever. She just, you know, she, just, just have, she literally just showed it to her class today. You, can, you just about can't have an argument with someone by disagreeing with, with them. Yes, yes I, I can. can. <laughs> um, I want you to know... So that's the thing. I mean, I, so that's, you know, that's why I'm not particularly entertained by... By your stuff with the Gervais fans, because bickering isn't entertaining to me. It's, it's nerve-wracking to I me. want you to know now... Just that this happened on many of the previous podcasts where I have gotten my feelings hurt, right? <laughs> yeah, my feelings are hurt. I know. And now but I don't feel, and, and I don't feel like I, it's my fault, It's though. not your fault. <laughs> okay, so. Have I given you the, the idea that it is your fault? <laughs> a little bit. When your feelings when? are hurt and you're, I'm the only one talking no, to you. No, in the moment. In the moment, right? <laughs> right? When I'm arguing with you? Yeah. But I think I told you afterwards that uh, uh, I'm glad it happened. Okay. And the other thing I'm going to say was um, my feelings aren't hurt now. That's good. So I, I felt like you were through. coming back. I, I went <laughs> through. So the thing is, if you obviously, I'm not. Go, I'm trying to build a robot that does agree with me with everything. And right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good, sir. <laughs> but that will be a different podcast. You, I don't want you. <laughs> I'm encouraging you to tell me what you think. You, to me, are the most honest person I've met, and also, I would say you communicate. When you're upset about things, yeah, and 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 uh, or that things bother you, and you and I think that's most people don't do that in a healthy way. No, I try to be pretty straight generally. Yeah, if I if I can get it out in a way that's not going to piss someone off, then I'll tell them the truth. <laughs> you know, and if you know, and then it's a it's a different decision if I'm going to piss them off. But even like, for example, when I was not, and if I get into any areas, of, you know, of our sexual things, and but that's not <laughs> important. Whatever. No, but when you said we got, I got here one day, and you were upset because I hadn't returned your text or something like that. Oh, this is very early on, yeah. Right, and I realized I'm in a he. The least I can do <laughs> in this business relationship 
I heard what you were saying, and it made. And, and since that time, I've made it a, a priority. You've been great. You've been absolutely great about returning things. And without even feeling like, oh, oh, I'm, and without feeling resentment at all. Because that's was, the old I Andy. Just, I, I try to be direct. I try to be really direct with yes. people, and I try to do it very early in my anger curve. Well, you, <laughs> you did. Know? Now, that's so, true, too. Yeah. You could have gotten... See, now, when I got my feelings hurt, did that hurt your feelings? No, I, but I saw it happening, but I also felt like, you know, you were challenging me to be honest with you. Ah, no, I mean right now, on this podcast. <laughs> no, I, yes. Oh, no, okay. I could see it happening. I could see that you were getting you were getting very defensive, but I also felt like, why am I going to start lying to you? <laughs> and, you know, this is very healthy because the thing is, is that I couldn't, I didn't know from my point of view, my point of view is like, oh, I, I, I get barraged with text, I get barraged with things. And so I'm I'm doing the best I can, which I'm not. Right. But uh, but then when I could hear it, separate from my own issues, that you tr- you need an answer on these things. You know, it was like the logo or whatever right. it was. So then I could hear it, and then I. So now I'm saying is I made a lot of progress with that, and because I don't think you do it in a because if you did it in a way, Andy, if you yelled immediately, <laughs> yes. but that's more what I do, tend to not, not I don't really present myself as someone who blows up but I tend to it's very hard for me to um, tell people uh, when they're bo- you know when they're when, when they're bothering me or whatever right. and sometimes I try to control other people's behavior with like jokes and stuff but I don't really communicate and sometimes I think there's nothing uh, there, there, there's nothing you can do about commu- sometimes just knowing that I can't control other people is the answer. Right. You know, it's like my belief that their behavior is going to hurt me somehow. Right. You know, or I won't be able to survive it. So it's it's just great to let go of that stuff. Good. Yeah, I don't know. I just I just for me, I always just try to like like if I can figure out who I'm dealing with and if I can if I'll meet them as far towards their end of the spectrum as I can, you know. I you know, when people shock me, then I get thrown, you know. But if I if I'm like okay, like writing with you, I, I never got upset because it's like I know that this was an emotionally fraught thing, you know. So I was in that case, it was easy for me to sort of come to your side of the aisle and go, all right, I'm just here, you know. <laughs> you yeah, know? I don't need to drive this train. It's your speech, you know. But whatever you want from me, I can give you, you know. Well, as I hope to move forward in life, I would like to be able to have a technique that works better i would like to get my i would like to improve things of how i work without beating myself up and hopefully i will i mean i I, there's a part of me that's like well every year it's going to be a little bit of like a roller coaster well of course it i mean no matter what it's going to be a roller coaster because you're giving an hour-long speech in front of a room full of comics i mean that's a nerve-wracking thing to do even if you're 22 years in you know when i got up there there's been a couple of years where we had this thing I don't understand what they're doing or what the philosophy is, but they have two microphones. Two mics, and ne- you're not talking into either of right. them. Right, and I'm used to going by that, by that, by that. <laughs> and lean in. So when yes. I would punch something, I would image. For some reason, they speak French, but they wouldn't answer. Nobody would answer me. Right. <laughs> I heard you. <laughs> but also, these. Do you know how those mics work? When yeah. they're like that. Yeah. Do you? I mean, I don't. I mean, I my assumption is is that they're calibrated to pick up the split the difference. But just in the middle. Yeah, I mean, you you never went off mic. That's what people told me. It sounded good. But then when I got up there, there were different heights, and I just didn't think that could be right. Yeah, it probably wasn't. So I brought them down. There was a lot of there was a lot of microphone mishegas at the beginning of of the speech. But let me tell you something. I got back to town. Uh, My career uh, is uh, heating up. Yeah. No, not really. Did you get? uh, I mean, do people give you feedback from the speech? I mean, were people? Yes. Yeah. Everybody. Everything this year was such a relief. I'm. I'm also different than I was at festivals. I used to go to these festivals. I would uh, hang out, hang out at the bar, which I like doing, but I was just exhausted. I think there's something actually maybe uh, I have to go to the series of doctors, but I'm losing energy a lot, and so uh, I and so folks, if I do pass, <laughs> please tell Josh to wait six months before he gets another co-host. But I was losing energy. Stay tuned for the best of thoughts spiral. <laughs> My favorite part of Andy's. I never got him to stop bragging on your face. <laughs> I can't, you know, if I could only have convinced him to not go after Ricky. I, I told him not to. But um, 
What was I saying? People were after. Oh, yes. Okay. Now you reminded me. Not by reminding me, but reminding me. Yeah. So I would. It's always stressful at the festivals. I like hanging out in the bars. I don't like drinking, but I do like uh, weed. So I'm looking for weed. Right. But uh, I. Uh, did you want me not to mention weed anymore? Oh no, please. Okay. Uh, so I was. Uh, but this year, I just took care of myself a lot more. I was very relieved after it, but I wasn't feeling that well. I just can't. I have to host a show. At, I'm not saying it's hard work. Nobody please take from this and I'm complaining. But I host a show at midnight every night. Every night at midnight, which is, yeah. Yeah, and then to, and I love the people. It's sometimes the only time I get to see people, but I just couldn't hang out in the bars, uh, you know, in the bar area too late. So I didn't do as much socializing, but I got more sleep, Yeah, that's which good. was good. But it's different from the old days where you go back to L.A. and there would be these known outlets that would write about stuff. Right. Like, I don't know. If someone can suggest to me a good search engine for my name, or maybe it's my career. <laughs> but I put Andy Kindler in there in the Google search. Nothing's yeah. coming up. Wow. Currently, it's the same old stuff comes up. Yeah. I want to know all the millions of articles that have been generated in the last two days about my speech at the festival. Do you have Google alerts? I do have Google alerts, but it just, it just it keeps coming like the no same one cares, crap. Andy. No. <laughs> no one cares. What? Oh, Time to face it. Oh, trying to face it, no one cares that I have Google alerts or they don't care about the speech. That, that the, the three articles they re- wrote are the three articles. I know. Well, you know what? Even I'm trying to think of who the pa- – like when, I f- when they first had the press, it was always like Variety maybe would cover it or Hollywood Reporter who would cover it. Yeah. And then occasionally newspapers would cover you it. You need to start taking on bigger names again. Hey, who should I take on? I don't know. Leno, oh. Leno worked for you for a while. Did you like the, did the Leno but joke? When you, work but well? when you, but it was really when you started hitting sacred cows. It was like Louis C.K. Ooh, God, oh my God! You took, oh, oh geez, with the Louis C.K. And the only thing that's bad about that is that the one thing I hate about comedians like, and I'm sorry I use the word hate, but I just use it. But one thing I hate about comedians like Bill Maher is they think that comedy is about saying provocative things. Right. I think that's. A horrible philosophy. I agree. You have to, you should be motivated by what you want to say, not because you go, oh, this will be a big splash. Right. Now, sure, we all had a great decapitated president's head bit. Sure. Luckily, you know, the uh, uh, Kathy I, played the scout. <laughs> I could never have made them. There's so many mistakes I've made. Right. I would never make the mis- that mistake that Kathy Griffin made. Of, of, that, of doing that fly bit. just like very boldly landed on your Is that forehead. Because I, but I did shower today. <laughs> I don't know. You have an Al Jaffe stink line coming off the <laughs> top of you. So now what did you happen? Did anything happen with you special? Uh, probably the highlight of when you were gone was uh, I got to uh, meet and co-interview Peter Bogdanovich last week, which was super cool. This is your... How could you bury the lead? What do they mean? <laughs> I still understand when they say it's the lead is the L E D E. I think I think it was supposed to be L E D E originally. So that, oh, it means lead though, the, right? So you buried the lead. This is big. What was the and what was this for your other podcast? The other podcast, uh, oh. the Edge with Mark Thompson. I um, told you never to. God damn it! The Edge with Mark Thompson. Josh, two hundred dollars. What? Is that your impression of me? Yes. Let me see it again. Two hundred dollars. Actually, that was, that one was a little more Rip Taylor. <laughs> that was Charles Nelson Riley. Here's my. You want me to see me do a impression of you? Please. You're killing yourself on Twitter. <laughs> Everyone hates you. Uh, it's your problem. Nobody likes it. Uh, people have told me. Have they told me they hate it? <laughs> I just want everybody to know that even when I say I'm over things. <laughs> kind of old, old. Yeah, it's a little grudge. It's, it's like, just a little information. It's down like the, road. the Ebola virus. It can li- it can hide out in your <laughs> testicles for two years. So um, okay, and he went over to the place where you record. Yeah, and w- so what happened? How it was uh, great. He was super cool. You know, he's he's a low key guy, as you probably yeah. know. But uh, he was really, you know, we talked to him for like two hours, and he was you know, two hours on the show. Really? Yeah. Wow. Really, and he was, you know, he's really interesting dude. And every time I've heard him be interviewed, I'm fascinated by him, by him. He was on Marin once. I heard him yeah. interviewed, and I felt I actually felt bad because I think I, I think I I sort of inadvertently busted him. <laughs> busted Marin? No, busted oh. Bugnar. Oh, something he said on the Marin show? Well, no, we were talking. No, on our show. Okay. 
He was uh, the stop pr- plugging the Marin. But Marin's I have to plug because he's responsible. Hey, he for plugged us. Marin plugged. He is us, responsible so. for, oh, for so, everything. Folks, listen to Mark Marin's WTF yeah, yeah, podcast. I don't know if you've heard about it. <laughs> okay, Mark WTF. So uh, you busted them. Well, he was telling the story about uh, about uh, um, auditioning Peter Fonda as a, when he was a young man and how he had come into the audition wearing sunglasses and I made a joke about. And I brought my affectation, Mr. Bogdanovich. And, oh, uh, he said that to him. Yeah. You know, I, I said that to him. Oh, right. And so, and so later on, Mark asked him about his, uh, his, his bandana that he wears. Peter Bogdanovich? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, and he was saying, you know, he was like, Mark asked him about his ascot. He's like, it's not, it's not, it's actually just a bandana. It's not. And then <laughs> I've been wearing, I started wearing it, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, now I guess it's just an affectation. <laughs> it's, it's like, oh, no. And he, but he seems like he laughs. He doesn't not laugh. No, he he's laugh, pretty. Really. He's pretty stoic. But he, you know, but he told great stories. And I mean, he, you know, he, you know, he was friends with John Ford and Orson Welles, and you know, and dated Civil Shepherd. And it's unbelievable. And I dated Civil Shepherd too. Yeah, in that. my mind. <laughs> so uh, the thing that he was talking about uh, 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 when I heard him before was that he just has like a lot of knowledge. Of move, I mean, like a unbelievable knowledge of movies. He's yeah, seen. incredible student of film, and and he was a you know he wrote about film a lot before before he even became a director. He was a journalist, and but before that, he studied with Stella Adler as an actor. And he's a good, he's an excellent actor too. Yeah, really good. He was great on The Sopranos. Yes, he was. Now, how did my name come up? Uh, well, he kept bringing it up, and I was like, "No, can we please, talk about you, please?" Blurs. Please, we've had Andy on the show before, and it wasn't good. <laughs> he, the, the movie that he, the, the last picture show might be the. I mean, there's no better movie than that. It's a great movie. What other movies would you say of, of his that are great? Paper Moon's really good. Paper Moon's outstanding. Uh, this is a test, Josh. What's what up, else? What's up, Doc? Really, I don't uh, know that movie. Mad is that Alan Arkin? No, that's uh, Barbara Streisand. Peter Fox. Barbara Streisand and Ryan O'Neill. <laughs> Is called What's Up Doc? Yeah. That's a Bugs Bunny expression. Huh, really? <laughs> is that in the movie? Like there's a Bugs Bunny, is that one of the B stories? No, it's not. Does it's anybody in the movie go, What's Up Doc? Barbara Streisand. She does not say Throughout that. the movie, constantly saying that. So how did she sound? And she has a carrot as well. What's the movie about? What's up, Doc? Uh, it's like a madcap comedy. I don't like there's madcaps. Like, there's a great, there's a great like 12 minute car chase through san francisco and a vw bug that's a, that's a classic why do i like any of those you think you'd know. like that one I, you know it was on it was always on broadcast tv when i was a little kid so i like i knew that movie because of that car chase well like mad 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 did you like mad 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 world uh i liked five out of seven mads i, I just for some reason it, it no, just i never I, oh, you it, never yeah i like it just because it's such a great Time capsule of True. all those great people, but is it make me laugh? No, it doesn't really make me laugh. Nothing madcap makes me laugh. Really. <laughs> well, maybe some of the Judy Holiday stuff makes me laugh, but I don't know if that's madcap or wordplay. Judy Holiday? She did those Born Born Yesterday movies. They were she was like a kind of a like a Gracie Allen type person. Okay. I know you're anti women in film and theater, so you might not be familiar. But I, as a person who often Leans you know what I think is women women are funny. Women but. women aren't dramatic. <laughs> uh Okay, so he uh, Yeah, so I didn't see I'm trying to think of anything mad. Well, I do He love, did he uh, he directed Mask. Right, which was with with Cher and uh that was a good Eric movie. Stoltz. That was a great movie. Uh, it was a great movie, but he uh, he ended up suing the studio. Why? Uh because they replaced his uh uh, Bruce Springsteen music with Bob Seger music. And why did they do that? Because I oh, Seger was hot then. I don't know. They just, I mean, that they maybe they didn't want to pay for the Bruce or whatever it was, but he they did it without his consent, and it uh, and he and he ended up suing them. Did he win? Uh, he didn't win, and he regretted doing. I asked him. I was like, you know, because he's had lots of ups and downs in his career, and I was like, so what's you know what's you know, what's the way to spend clout? You know, is it, is it to like, you know, do you collect it? Do you do, you know, do you try to do hit after hit or do you like take the clout from a hit and then try to do something experimental? Do you, you know, and he's like, it's a really good question. I don't know, but 
it wasn't that <laughs> when I'm talking about suing. Oh, of course, he, it, it made, he made enemies and stuff. He made enemies and he, you know, he got nothing out of it. He said, I should have just taken a bow and said thank you because the movie was you know, hugely well received. Oh. But he was all bitter about it instead, you know. What did you, did you, did you uh, I wonder, like, because I see the same, uh, I'm not saying I've had Peter Bogdanovich's career, because I, I'm more, I'm a triple threat. Right. No, uh, but I, uh, uh. You're threatened three times a night. <laughs> <laughs> but I know the self-sabotage thing. I know the feeling. Of, what Was that what, it, why did he feel like he did sue? I think in retrospect. He sees it as a moment of self-sabotage. I think at the time he saw it as artistic uh, entitlement. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, And he ended up re-releasing the movie with the Springsteen track as a director's cut. Oh, that's cool. Because Springsteen gave it to him for free. So. Every story ends up with, and then Springsteen brought me back. So I don't have one of those stories. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing. It's like... Uh, the argument that we were having before about me on Twitter. So, like, one of the things that's my problem is I, f- the only way I can move forward in life, I'm being honest now. Okay. All of that is literally be- what I've done before is literally behind me. Right. I can't do anything about that. No. I can only do the next second, and that's my problem, though. Because my thing is like, oh yeah, of course Josh is right. Everybody hates me on Twitter. Everyone knows I'm obnoxious. My career will end. It's like it goes down this spinning, spinning, right. spinning, spinning, spinning. But if I could just, because I'm trying to figure out what is self, why is I think self sabotage a lot of times is about fear. Right. Like I've gotten nervous before things, so somehow you can get anger at something else, and you right. feel like it gets it out. Right. So maybe it's just all fear, self sabotage. I I guess, you know, I mean, I mean, almost every glitch is based in fear, I think, you know, almost yeah. every, almost every thing that we fuck over ourselves with is fear based, you know? Well, even things like, uh, doing, uh, radio and like doing uh, promotions for comedy or radio interviews, yeah. I would, my stomach used to get so knotted up for it. Really? And it even can sometimes now, but it's just a skill that bring, you know, like, Three, two, one, be funny type of thing. Yeah, and I look back over the years. I've it's like it, it always gets me churning in a way, but it's still it's inter- It's just interesting to me how you how it's like a performance anxiety thing too in a way. You know, sometimes I don't feel that if I'm doing a spot. Right, but you're course. terrified. I mean, I think it. Ba- I mean, it's based on you being terrified of disappointing people. You know, you think that's it for everybody? I think I think it's it, it's acute for you, but yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, I mean, you know, we all just want to be loved, Andy. (laughs) Well, that's the other thing that we're trying to deal with in therapy is that my family, you weren't, maybe if I said this before on a different podcast, shoot me, but you weren't separate from your emotion. In other words, like you didn't get the sense that you're you're a good boy, but you did a bad thing. It was always like you are a bad thing, Right. right? And so in my family... If people got mad, they better have a good reason to get mad. You know what I mean? Right. So now in my that's why in my life, like I defend, I have to defend my Twitter presence. Right. Because I can't accept the fact that I would be that people are imperfect and are obnoxious and do things that are whatever. Right. And and so when you're able to accept that, just say like you let it go, then it's a whole different thing. But that used to be I remember I remember a lot of like on stand up specials where I would just get so churned up. But I don't know that, that that part of getting churned up necessarily ever ends. But you do get better at dealing with it. And I think it's always better when you do recognize what's going on. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, no, I think if you can name it, you take some of the power away from it generally. You know, if you can get it out outside of your head rather than just have it rattle around in there, you're in better shape generally. But I just realized that I think the problem is. That I do not know how to express myself when something is wrong or if I don't like something like a normal person. Right. So it comes out in weird ways, comedy, or maybe in the old days I'd save it up and explode. Right. But to just the idea of being able to communicate that something – like you know, telling somebody in the movie theater they're talking too loud or whatever the thing is, those things make me freeze up. Right. How are you with those? Well, I don't like confrontation, but that's why I've sort of developed this skill of be, of non-confrontive confrontation, <laughs> you know? 
Right, because because well, yeah, the that's thing why is, I, you know that's why, like I said, I I tend to be direct about things early on in my anger curve, so anger isn't what's guiding my behavior. You yeah. Know? Well, the the other big lesson I learned this year was the uh, I don't know why is it the end of the year? Are we doing it on the end of the year show for you? It is. It's like your fiscal year because yeah, it, fiscal... it, it ended with the speech. Um, the end of the year lesson is. Uh, it was a misconception to think that when I took Prozac and was in therapy, that uh, everything was going to be great. Right. <laughs> it's 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 up and down, people. Well, but I mean, it's been a bit, it's been a huge discovery for you just that you had problems, problems. you know. Because I thought I was so great. <laughs> Didn't you think I was so great? <laughs> no, I never thought you had problems. What? <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> but you know, but yeah, but I mean, like I said. Watching you this year versus the last even couple of years leading up to the speech, it was a different thing. It wasn't just like, I have to hide in my cave for a, year, for a month and flagellate myself into the speech. <laughs> well, what doesn't get cured immediately is the, is the task I have to do and then just spinning out into distractions. Right. That has not been cured. Right. It's better, maybe, or it's more stirred up. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, this is the sort of your yearly peak of it all. You know, I know. I feel so relieved now. I can only imagine. I get just, up just the... talking to you last week before the speech is like I can only imagine what the did I sound e- what tense? The, what the exhale post speech must feel like for you? I think I did email you that I went through a dark night. See, yeah, I I, 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 I I went through a dark night after that too. Oh, really? So I had gone through a dark night earlier in the week, and then I was everything was cruising. Yeah. And then I just hit the wall again. After the speech? No, no, before. Yeah, no, I that talked was, to you after and you said I, yeah. it went great, but I was terrified before the speech. Right. But, I mean, earlier in the week I said to you I went through a dark night. Right. And so I went through two dark nights. Right. Because that's another thing, too. You go, oh, I guess I'm over my dark night of the soul. I don't know where I got this uh, attitude towards life of like, oh, now you're over that. Now you're on to something else. Right. I think it has to do with... Thinking you're a little black and white thinking. That's exactly what it is. That is the problem. My family is very good at being judgmental. I thank them for my comedy. Yeah. But the other side of it is that you that that the idea that you have to that you can never get angry, or if you do get angry, you have to justify why you're angry. And uh, good people don't get angry. Right. It's not good. You didn't have that, right? I did. Well, no, I didn't. My dad. My dad. My dad didn't wasn't a big expressor of his feelings. You know, it's like his anger would come out explosively. It, like it took a lot to trigger it, but when it got triggered, he would you know he was he would shout or he would punch a wall. Or, you know. Were you were you scared of him in that of, of him exploding? I'm not trying to make. A I wasn't. Thing. I was never physically scared of him. Like right. I never ever thought I was going to get hit by him. Right. Um, but the fact that you you know just the fact that you got my dad to yell meant. We're done now. <laughs> right, know, like, right, yeah. You know. How about your mom? Uh, my mom was, you know, an emotional, you know, she was just an open book about every emotion, <laughs> about every single emotion, you know. But the thing in my house was you could diffuse any mood with a good joke. Like, every, right. there, there was no taboo in my house about funny. Like, funny was funny. And so no matter how heated, if you came out with a funny joke, Laughter was the next thing, you know, and the fight was basically over, you know, you could, but conversely, if you came out with a, like a smart ass or a bad joke, you could escalate the <laughs> situation. <laughs> it wasn't just like, oh, he made a joke. Everything's fine. But if it was a good joke, you would get a laugh. <laughs> well, I, I so the bar was, the bar was high. The comedy bar was sort of high in my house. But like I said, it was like, there was no taboo. So w- what we were taught was that there was a funny side that, to everything. It, well, you know. if I would, dis- and you know, I, I don't want to get heavy. I do, but you know, you won't allow me. But uh, <laughs> if I was going to say what I think, I do believe that there's a God, and that whether it's love or whatever you want to call it, when you tap into this, whatever the is, you feel a connection to everything around you. And I think the ability to laugh. It sounds like a cliche, but that is so incredibly important. You got such a gift. Oh that. God, yeah. I mean, and that. I mean, to, you know, I got a great gift from my parents, and that's why I'm not bitter that they died young. You know, I still feel more lucky than screwed to right. have had them. You know, yeah. 
but they were, you know, they were really smart, really funny people. And, and yeah, they had, you know, they were broken too, <laughs> just like we all are, but they were sort of trying, you know, they were very much trying to inflict different damage, at least on my brother and I, than had been inflicted on them. <laughs> right. Know, right. At least, they were at least trying to mix it up a little. Well, that's interesting. Now I know, I know it's not just a Jewish thing, but my family had that too, where as screwed up as we all might be, Everybody in my family has a good sense of humor. Right. You know, and that's a Jewish thing, too. It is a Jewish thing yeah. to some degree. Other people, too. But it is odd when you meet people who don't, like Joel Madison said this years ago. We used to do these. Joel Madison would do a series of jokes about people when they come up to him in the club, you know, uh -huh. like they go, Oh, you, you, uh, uh, you, you live in LA. Do you, do you, they don't never say the comedy store. They go, Do you play the club? And you know, so whatever they would call, they go, oh, of course I played the club. Right. And they go, well, do you change your material every night? They go, you have to if you're going to play the club. He would just right. agree with. Yeah. And his impression of a bad audience member was a guy comes over, his wife, he goes, I'm sorry, my wife doesn't like comedy. She doesn't think it's funny. <laughs> and, and that was like a, there are people who don't have a sense of humor or. or they, yeah, they, or, don't, they don't see a purpose in it. Right. Yeah. It's just, it's not. You know, and some, it's so, you know, I grew up in Minnesota, so there's yeah. a lot of those people, you know, there's a lot of just sort of stoic, Sto yeah. Nordic people there, you know. But I think and you told some me. Some of them are science teachers, I found out. <laughs> Wait, oh. <laughs> and so what does that, what does that mean? I they, mean, they were the only teachers who hated my guts. Why? Because I was a smart ass. <laughs> did you not like science? No, I did not. How about now? I mean, I love science. Right. <laughs> I don't, not. If I have to study it, but yeah. I love that there are people who do. <laughs> I just feel like that some of the science people, I, I, look, I believe this is a flat earth. I can't prove it, Josh. Yeah. I can't prove it. But I'll accept these phony pictures as saying it's round. Right. But there's a certain arrogance that some of these scientific people have, like especially the TV scientific people, where they, not all of them, I love Brian Greene, but some of them are like, yeah, nobody. There's not, there's not like uh, there's not enough science on TV. There's not enough. They're complaining all the time. Have I talked about this before? <laughs> no, I'm just laughing at how bad a scientist impression you're doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but they think that they're superior. They think because they know science that they're superior people. I get that feeling from some of them. Well, I think it's more that. I mean, there's you know, like Alan Alda like went on a big crusade over the last several years of of discussing this very thing which is teaching scientists how to communicate oh with, really with, with lay people yeah because it, because they do tend to come off as arrogant and you know and many of them are on the spectrum you know so right. so you know that that is a that it's almost like become becoming a sort of branch of educating in the sciences is you know it's one thing to know this thing but it's another thing to be able to communicate it to people who need, and need as to he learn it. now, what is he? Is he made conclusions about, it or is it just like an open? No, thing? I think it's just sort of his personal. Is he, is he into, he's into science, right? Yeah. yeah. So it was just sort of it was sort of his personal crusade, and probably still is. But I just remember hearing hearing about it several times a few years back. Well, Brian Greene, I've seen on Colbert, and I've tried to read some of his books. I don't get through them that well, but he's very good. Because he's able to say, like he says, the universe is this, and he shows you like it's a piece of fabric. You start to get the idea from how he explains it. But I couldn't. I mean, there's nothing Stephen Hawking has ever said. Do I? Do I? Do I get? I couldn't get two pages into his his books. I, years ago, when I was on the road, I listened to a Brief History of Time. And did did you on on tape in my car? And. Uh, it was good. That was a way better way to... Maybe I'll do that. Way better because you learn that if I don't, you know, because, you know, what it was when I tried to, when you read it, it's like you just keep reading the same page over and over again. Right. But when you listen you know, to but it... But when you're listening to it, it's like he's a good enough teacher so that if you didn't really understand a concept, you didn't actually have to in order to go on. It's like the stuff that you really need to understand in order to keep moving is explained well enough so that you can. So let me ask you this. If I'm not putting you on the spot, I... I know what I think his general contribution is, but unlike the theory of relativity and thing, the general, you know, all the stuff that Einstein came through, I, what is his, is it the Big Bang? Is that his thing? Well, he's more about quant, I think he's more about quantum theory than is, is where his breakthroughs were, which are subatomic particles. 
quark, this, quark, right. quarks and the like. And with but this, don't make me try to explain. Now, this Stephen quantum Hawking's. theory where you can predict where it's like more of a predictable. I can predict, but so, but but something can be in two this places. Is, we, and, we, listen to we me. We should not. No, no, you tell me. So Shut the hell not up. Be talking about Shut the physics. hell up. We I'm telling you. Not be talking about physics. You know what? We'll do a special show. I went and actually saw uh, years ago. I went and saw um, Hawking speak at the University of Minnesota. Was it great? Uh, I didn't really understand. He was talking about chaos theory, and I wasn't really understanding very much. But uh, but it was cool to see him, you know, just as a giant. And he answered questions, which took for fucking ever. <laughs> yeah, and you were like, pick up the energy. Yeah. Look, we get it. I get it. That is a weird silence when you're like, there was like probably three thousand people in this auditorium at U of M. And it's a weird, weird silence when like 3,000 people are waiting for Stephen Hawking to program his answer to a question. And he has ALS? Yeah. And he's like one of the oldest people? I mean, he's survived so long. Yeah. I mean, he outlived his prognosis by about half a century so far. So, And before we close this podcast, because I mean, we've gone on for two hours, but I do want to say that I was very sad. It was like really hit me hard about Sam Shepard dying yeah. because I had done – his plays in college and he i think he had als i think he did too he did yeah. too and i just to me he was such a hero to me and when i was in college i got to write we put on a production of mad dog blues which was one of his plays and in mad dog blues he supplies the lyrics but every production changed the music. That's what he decided. That's what he wanted to do. Right. So I wrote my music to it. And it was like one of the greatest experiences of my life. But for years, I was like, if I can just meet Sam Shepard and I play him this music, <laughs> he will pluck me out of obscurity and right. everything will be great. Finally, you someone got it right. <laughs> but I love the way he – I don't know if anybody gets a chance to read. I, I, haven't, I don't know if I've even read True West in a long time. But he he's, was an unbelievable playwright. And he really did – Right, like I felt that period when I was taking acid and stuff like that, or like when you're listening to uh, words are flowing out like endless rain to a paper cup. Right. I, 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 or Mr. Tambourine Man. He really had the hallucinatory feel. Yeah. And True West is the only play I ever really studied of his. Did you like that play? Well, great play. Yeah, great play. And, you, and I thought also you happen to just be a great actor, too. Yeah, absolutely. Days of Heaven. I remember that movie. I haven't seen it in a long time. He was actually cooler than Chuck Yeager as Chuck Yeager, which is pretty tough. <laughs> what is it that you haven't covered that you want to cover? Um, I want to reiterate that we're doing a live podcast at Great. Acme Comedy Club, Acme Comedy Company, on August twenty fourth at five thirty. Uh, you can uh, book tickets at uh, acmecomedycompany dot com, or uh, you could uh, make reservations at six one two three three eight six three nine three. That is good memory from every radio spot I've done <laughs> for 25 years at Acme Comedy Club. Well, the, this is really going to be interesting because when we started, the, when you started the podcast, we like we just didn't know what we we're going to, you know, we're going to have guests. What are we going to do? I'm actually interested. At first, it sounded like I don't want anybody around, yeah. but now I'm actually interested to how it's going to be with people around. Yeah, it'll be. Uh, I don't know. It'll be better. It, for me, it'll be nice uh, because there will be actually people listening to what I'm saying during the podcast. Huh? For a exactly. Uh, oh, did you want me? I thought I was to be the main guy with the not listening. <laughs> uh, no, I'm looking forward to you it. No, I almost launched into my egomaniacal character again. Yeah. And I just I hate it. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> but it's, tell me that even though you hate Andy, it's really good. It's Yeah. It's the best, worst Andy it can be. I will say this. I have stopped, and you'll, you can mark me from this day on, uh, that I will not be... I felt when that guy wrote that article that I had to say something, and maybe I was wrong, but it's over. <laughs> okay. It is over. You can judge me from this day forward about that particular idiot, Gervais. Okay. Okay? I'm done with it. I'm still scared that someone's going to sue me or something. I don't understand this. How someone can accuse me of slander? No, you need to relax. It's well, just some they, idiot. Why would they anybody can publish an article? On, anybody can make an article, right? On the web, anyone can. So, so relax. I and will just take stop your, addressing it. I will take your message, and you will see if I don't become the best boy ever. 
you know what? I want you to be happy. I don't think this makes you happy. No, because I wake up in the morning. (laughs) Look, if you're sleeping with a gun, you wake up in the morning, and you're looking out the window to see if anyone's coming, that's not good. No, it's not so good. Yeah, also that whole world of – there is a world on Twitter – where it's like kind of like I'm dying up here where they like, yeah, you're an idiot. You're a moron. You're, it's like I'm not really of that world. No. <laughs> yeah. that, I, mean, that's, I mean, that's the thing is that, you know, ultimately at the core of it, the reason is I'm not entertained by it is it doesn't – it's not the you that, that you know. That I know. Yeah, it's just it's emba- – but the thing is, is there's nothing to me more embarrassing that I've found so far than Twitter. <laughs> than Twitter. But that's also a thing I need to accept. I need to accept I embarrassed myself. Yeah. You know? So what? Yeah, no, it doesn't matter. But it's the end of the world for me. Yeah, no. Yeah. I, mean, I agree that you don't need to dwell on the past on it. And I, and I also agree that there's like, a, there's like a deep, deep bench of people who like you more than there is a bench of people who are against you. And that shouldn't even matter. It shouldn't really in the final analysis. It's right. me. I have to. It's me. I have to get to love me, Josh. <laughs> I got to get to love me, Josh. Who is the person that you're trying to please? It's the person who lives inside. Once you face your problems, you will take some cyanide. I, I said, uh, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, I'm the person. I, I'm the one I want. That's what Margaret Cho had that show. Ah. Uh. What is that thing How that you we were doing? That with a, a what was Margaret that thing Cho? that you were doing? No, because she said, <laughs> I'm the one that I want. And I used to make that fun was of her. a big production to end with Margaret Cho is all I'm saying. No, because it is true. What she was saying is true. Yeah. And I made fun of her at the time because I was mean to her. Right. I mean, I loved her. I loved Margaret, but I was, uh, was, I went through an angry phase. But I'm the one that I want. I understand it more now. Like, you don't want it to be creepy that you love yourself. Right. But you, you, you want to let that part go where you're doing comedy or whatever you are doing because you want to be liked. Right. You know, uh, I think that's not a hundred percent thing, but I think, I think it's, it can get better. How about for you? Do you feel that you don't like, you don't go through the, well, obviously you don't bicker, but do you worry about how you're perceived or not so much as a person? Uh, yes, I totally worry about how I, how I'm perceived, but it's also one of those things that, I'm sensitive about with myself. Like, like I don't like when I'm, when I'm measuring myself by what I think other people think about me. And you're immediately aware of it probably. And I become aware of it and I try to rid myself of it, you know, because really my, my default answer is, is no one gives a shit about you. That is the main thing. But I don't, but I don't, and it's not a bad thing. I just, it's, but it's really is what I believe. It's, it's, I really truly believe that no, you know, Ninety nine, nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine people out of a million aren't thinking about me at all. Yeah, and, and, and that's and, also and that's also what Susan's father told her. Like you know, no one gives a shit about you. Yeah, you know? and, and it, but it's a comforting thing as far as I'm. Yes, I mean it's know? a positive. He was saying it is a comforting thing. You know, but it, and it works in both directions. You know, it also you know you can't. It's not like people, you know, it's like if I get into the high schoolish thing and, you know, which I do sometimes with stand up, that whole like, why am I not invited to that show? Why am I not? Maybe that, that but... voice is bad. That's, that, that's how I think we got to the crying <laughs> voice last time. Uh, right. But whenever I hear myself thinking that, you know, that same theory applies, which is no one is actively not thinking of you. Right, you right, know? right. It's like no one, you know, they have their list of people who are their first thoughts, and that's usually all that's sufficient. Yes. You know, so they aren't going to get to me in their list, their mental list, you know, and it's not their fault and it's not an act of hostility or an act of neglect. It's just, (laughs) they didn't think of me. Yeah. And the thing, this is the part of, 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 of Buddhism that I do relate to for as far as I can understand it is that if you place in life that the success is getting more money or getting better at Twitter or whatever it is, that's the, it's really letting, it's really not getting too attached to the ups and downs. Right. And so that's what, that, that is a good lesson to learn, you know? Yeah. I mean, all I know really is that the only part of me that thinks that something's wrong is my ego. You know, it's always the thing that's telling me that something's wrong. Now, now the ego that does come from like Greek even, right? I mean, the fact that it's the ego and the id, 
I mean, they've known this forever in a way, in yeah. a certain way. So the ego, explain to me like I'm a child. The ego is the part of yourself that is saying you're good or bad or evaluating yourself? Yeah, it's, your, it's, the, it's the level of self-worth that you project to the world. How about that? And then what's the id? The id is the darker part of yourself, I think. It's and that a, might not a, be so accurate. Is that a Freud uh, thing? Uh, yeah, don't, you know, don't make me be specific or right, right. here. Because <laughs> so, I, I won't be. But I that's wanna. a very healthy thing. And for the listeners out there, because people come here, they're lost, Josh. Of course. Your thought spiral people? That's like, let's look for guidance on a show called Thought Spiral. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, they've tried everything before sure. they've come to. They, I mean, they tried the Constructive Thought podcast. <laughs> they they've thought, tried themed podcasts. <laughs> right. They've, and they're coming here because they're lost. And right. It's their last chance. <laughs> Absolutely. And the lesson that we want to teach them is, uh, uh, I'm okay, you're okay? You know, if you can get to I'm okay like twice a week. Right. I figure you're probably doing okay. The fact that you're able to identify your ego as separately from yourself is gr- very healthy. And that, believe it or not, was what I wasn't able to do before I took therapy and, and medication, I would be able to remind myself about once a month when I, when I, when I was like so spun out of control. Right. Oh, it's about you wanting to be loved by everybody again. Right. But now I'm conscious of it all the time. I don't want to be annoying about it, but I want to be conscious of it all the time because it has been exhausting. And I realize at parties everywhere, you know, trying to be funny. Right. Like, and, and trying to be on. Right. You know, and... And there's times when I'm on, like we've been here, like we, we have had parties here. Uh, one time we had a party here with Gruber and all those guys, and then we did this song for four hours. And we just literally did it for hours. So I like the part of me that's a clown kind of, um, but I don't like that I feel that I have to perform and I don't like that I am a value that any place I go in it's lunch with Josh like I like in the old days it'd be like that was a failure the lunch with Josh <laughs> I fucked <laughs> I screwed it up you know all that kind of stuff just being conscious I used to deny that these things were problems like right. that I I was really into that. Oh, there's no problem but now when you realize it, it's like you almost almost not always but almost Always realizing it makes it at least better in the moment, because you stop trying. Just you stop being, trying. Just being present. You mean? Yeah, but you stop trying to do what you're doing. In other words, like right. you know, you're trying to make Josh like you. You're trying to make Josh like you. Just by realizing that, you stop a little bit. Right. Yeah, I mean, especially when you're with someone for whom that's no longer a negotiating point. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, I like you already. I mean, you're in. <laughs> you know? Right. But the and the other thing is this idea. That and I never got this, even though people told it to me before. But this idea of you can't control other people's behavior, and you don't have to control other people's. It doesn't mean like you can't say things. Right. You can influence other people's behavior, but you can't such control. Such a relief. It. Yeah. it is such a relief. I put pressure on every person in my life. You, everybody, I would put pressure on, because if they act in the ways that bothered me or something, I would send out that message and or argue with them. Right. You know. And so I think the, the, learning that not only that you can't control them, but that, that your happiness is not controlled by what they think of you. Right. Well, and yeah, and fuck, man, if, if showbiz teaches you nothing else, <laughs> yeah. that, that, that should be one of the lessons you take away. You know? I think it's so interesting because I, I went to this, this restaurant uh, coffee place here called Rumi. Yeah. And it's based on... Uh, Poet, right? The Sufi, and poet. so like when I first got into therapy, it said, uh, so he, "What he does is the guy who owns the place. He's a cool guy. He goes from table to table and he opens up a roomy thing and you pick a page huh, and okay. you read." So the thing I read was, "It does. It literally does not matter what other people think of you." Right. And so it was just like you could hear these things a million times and not get the message, right? And it was like I got the message. That's why it's so weird, like when they misinterpret things with the secret or whatever, but there are these deep Eastern things that do work, but sometimes they just sound like noise if it's a life coach. Yeah, it really just depends like what rapping they come in <laughs> that day. Right, know? right. We've talked 
normally this is long we start looking at the watch and we had a fight we had a fight in the middle too so apparently (laughs) it wasn't a it wasn't a fight you were wrong and you were mean and you were nasty (laughs) also you weren't cognizant and then there was a certain amount of nastiness from you i hadn't seen previously but then when you realize that you were acting inappropriately and that I'm right, uh-huh. and that the Ricky Gervais thing is like performance art. Right, it's Andy Kaufman. Honest, honest to God, had you blocked him, walked away, that would have been, been perfect. It would have been fucking Andy Kaufman. No, that's what I'm going to do now. <laughs> that's what I'm going to do now. I, I, I will be pulling out. You did out. not stick the landing, I, but still, I, sw- <laughs> but see, I could do the landing. You know what? Uh, that's why they have things on the, on the. That's why they have an eraser in the thing. There you go. And that's not why they have an eraser, but that's why there's always another day. That's why they have a delete. Well, anyway, don't forget, you can always uh, email us. Email us at thoughtspiralshow at gmail.com. We got a lot of uh, nice emails this week, which I forwarded to you and also responded to, but that's a whole different thing. But now I'm back from Montreal. I've got plenty, go. plenty of time, and all I'm going to do is answer those emails. Just, you know, answer an occasional one at least. But I'm very happy that you are, that you are nice enough to say I can send it to you and then you can send it to them. How do you do that? <laughs> Just write it back and I'll cut and paste. I'll copy okay, it. Okay, don't I'll, edit my thing. I won't edit. I promise I won't edit. Um, the uh, live show. Live show, Acme Comedy Club, August 24th at 5.30 p.m., acmecomedycompany.com. Yeah, because pe- this is going to go out uh, when? Uh, next did, Monday? This will be Monday the 7th. Okay. Uh, tomorrow, the 8th, uh, the Cinematic Titanic box set is officially released. All 12 episodes, half live, half studio, funny mystery science theater, people, movie riffing. Where does it say, where does it say Josh promotes a uh, project separate from me? Is there a sign on me saying, uh, please promote your own things? I don't know. Let's go back to the hour we talked about your speech. All right. Let's go back. You know, the thing is, I don't feel like that this was enough about me, this, uh, this whole – there was a few <laughs> minutes there where I actually said, how are you doing? You did. And then we got into Peter Bogdanovich and then back to you. Right. So I think – you know, people say I'm self-absorbed. I don't You really, heard them I, say that? Really? No, I, no, I don't hear them say <laughs> okay. that. And then the other thing is that uh, – why do I feel like there's one more thing we have to promote – Plus, Andy's week at Acme that whole week. Not, uh, just, week not, all- not just the uh, podcast, but Tuesday through Saturday of that week, the 22nd through the 25th. Andy will be at Acme Comedy Company. I'll be there Tuesday through Thursday with him. My question is this. Do you, we have analytics that you know how many people in Minnesota have listened to us? Yeah, and it's not quite enough to justify doing a live podcast. To even be making the... Oh, really? There's hundreds, but I, you know, we'd, you know, we're going to we're gonna have to hit them. I assume... I assumed it was my fame that would bring people. <laughs> no, you're more famous than many. But what was this? About? I know neither one of us are famous. I love to say that I'm famous or or talk about being famous. Yeah. But that's your home turf. I'm hoping you increase the the usual. Spotty. I think I will. I think I will increase it a little bit. Oh, because I only because like my brother will come. <laughs> I went with a door deal. I went with a door deal. <laughs> Anything else? Um, I don't think so. This was great. Congratulations on getting through Montreal. Thank but, you, uh, and thank you for being nice to me during our f- pr- fight. <laughs> my, my pleasure. That, we've had two fights, I think. The first one and this one. It was all it's the same topic, I think. It's so stupid, because you're obviously not right. <laughs> of course not. You know how much money I'm being offered for these Twitter fights? I know. It's, it's, it's ingenious is what it is, really. I'll give you a dollar if you come up with a good closing line. Who is the person that you're trying to please? It's the person who lives inside. Once you face your problems, you will take some cyanide. I I said, uh, ooh, ah, 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 ooh, ah, 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 I'm the person I, I'm the one I want. 